Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on today's webinar. Uh, my name is Maggie Cool, and I work on the research communications team at the Michael J. Fox Foundation. I am usually on the other end of these webinars as the producer, but today I'm joining you to take you through a conversation that goes deep into science, but uh, has a lot of potential to transform how we define, measure, and treat Parkinson's disease. So today we are going to talk about how technology is letting scientists read or sequence our genes and proteins, the cellular parts that make us who we are, and look for differences that are linked to Parkinson's disease so that they can find better ways to measure Parkinson's and develop new therapies against what does go wrong. Um, some housekeeping items before we jump into today's conversation. On your screen, you see a Q&A box, and throughout the hour, you can enter your questions there, and our team in the back end will uh, be answering them and sending us up some to send to our panelists. And we are also providing today's slides for download. You should see a box called Resource List on your screen. Click there, and the document will open in a new browser window. You can save or print from there. and refer back to it later or share with other people who couldn't join us today. Um, speaking of not joining us today, also in that resource list is a link to a library of webinars. Every month we cover a topic on Parkinson's symptoms or research. So if you have a question about something that we're not covering today, you can click through there and watch whenever your time allows. All right, let's meet our panelists who today are going to talk to us about genetic sequencing. Uh, we have an all-star panel of people who work with me at the foundation and some external scientists. Joining us are Bradford Casey, uh, who is on our research programs team, Dr. David Craig, who is co-director of the Institute of Translational Genomics at the University of Southern California, uh, Dr. Samantha Hutton on our research partnerships team, and Dr. Kendall, Dr. Kendall Van Curen Jensen, Professor of Neurogenomics at the Translational Genomics Research Institute in Arizona. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. All right, making sure you guys are there. Um, okay, so we are going to dive into our conversation. Um, Bradford, I want to turn it over to you and explain what we're seeing on this slide. DNA, RNA, proteins, can you explain these instructions and ingredients for making us who we are? Sure, Maggie. So DNA is a molecule that's present in every one of the cells in our body, right? Throughout development, our cells divide, so they, uh, at least at birth, essentially all have the same copies of DNA. Uh, now, the individual genes that are present in DNA are actually transcribed by proteins in our body and into RNA molecules, and each of those becomes its own little template, uh, and those templates are used to create the individual proteins. And so uh, while the DNA is essentially shared throughout the tissues of, of our bodies, the the different levels and diversity of RNA that's present in each cell um, changes from cell to cell and throughout life. All right, and then DNA and RNA make proteins. What do those do in our bodies? Sure, Bradford. so proteins are kind of the, uh, the complex molecules that, that build everything together. Uh, so that includes all the structural components of our cells, but also uh, handling a lot of the tiny machines that go on in each of our cells to actually get work done. Uh, so proteins are kind of the final product in, in this formula. Gotcha. And Samantha, we often use an analogy of, um, of cooking or baking, right, with these. Can you uh, walk us through that corollary? Yeah, so I, we can sort of think of it as um, DNA sort of being the, the recipe book or the overall instruction template, um, and RNA is sort of the, the sous chefs or the, the helpers in the kitchen um, sort of navigating that process and, and getting things done, and the protein is the final dish that goes out of the kitchen and uh, gets sent to your plate um, for you to enjoy. Okay. All right, just a, a grounding as we um, dive into a lot of work around these um, around these parts. Um, Dr. David Craig, I want to turn it over to you and talk about heredity and how we get our DNA from our parents and, and what that means for, uh, for making us who we are, everything from eye color to disease risk. Yeah, so um, I think that we all get a sense that, you know, we get um, 
a lot of our traits are genetic traits um, from our mother and from our father. And there's a series of things that they kind of predispose ourselves to. Um, and we can think of some of these traits as maybe making us more susceptible to disease. Some of these traits may just provide us with different um, um, eye color, like you mentioned. And a lot of times these differences are basically single letter changes within the DNA, something that might change the word live to love. That changes the entire meaning of the sentence. However, sometimes changing a letter doesn't mean too much. The big thing that we do then is we look at about um, 3 billion letters at the DNA level to try to figure out what it means over a lifetime. There's a lot of things that happen over a lifetime, and basically then we have to start looking at, well, how are our genes responding? What's turned on and off? And that's where we start to look at RNA, and that tells us a little bit more about exposures because what we're born with is not necessarily what we always become. It's a mixture, and that's where that term epigenetics come in, things that are not inherited. The two together is really what we're trying to look at. Okay. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Van Kieran Jensen, Kendall, what are those other factors other than um, inheriting from our parents that can change our DNA or yeah. RNA? So one of the great things about studying RNA is because if you if you just have one recipe but you have lots of different ingredients, you can make lots of different kinds of cakes, right? So just going back to the baking analogy. But um, with this, you, you change the ingredients and you change sort of the outcomes. And things that can affect um, the RNA expression are things like your exposure to the environment or stress or even age. Parkinson's disease is um, also a disease of age. And as these molecules and things um, occur and function in your body throughout your life, um, things can accumulate or change in the way that they function too. So um, there are lots of different risk factors in addition to genetics like environment, age, and other things that you're exposed to over your lifetime. Okay, so to, to continue our, our analogy, it's kind of like if you have a different sort of flour, cake flour versus a you know, regular old unbleached flour and maybe even the type of oven that you're using. So there's there's just a lot of a lot of different factors in that process that can impact the the uh, end result, the dish or cake that comes out of the oven. Um, okay. Interesting. I, I have a question, um, Kendall. Does once a change is made in your DNA or your RNA, is it permanent or do these fluctuate over your lifetime? So mostly the DNA stays the same. There are changes that occur that you can wind up the DNA more tightly or less tightly so that you can get to differences in expression of the RNA. But for the most part, the DNA stays the same. It's really why we're interested in studying the RNA in particular is we can study then thousands and thousands of these RNA molecules that are constantly changing. So they change all the time in your cells, from seconds to hours to, again, years, just depending on you know what's required for that cell at that time. So for instance, if you're sick, then molecules change in order to try to make you healthy and combat that sickness. And so for a little while, the expression of your RNA will change in response to that. And then, again, as you do different things in life, if you're exercising more or you're doing other things, again, the cells in your body are responding to that. And we see that as a reflection in the expression of the RNA molecules. So they do change constantly throughout your life. But that does help us to look at different factors that can affect disease or even healthy um, living. Okay, so it's not always uh, for bad then if there are changes you can do positive things in your life to perhaps uh, re reset the ingredients to be uh, to be better. That's great. Okay, good hope. Um, all right, let's move on to the next slide uh, and talk a little bit about the work you all are doing to actually read what's happening in DNA and RNA. David, like you were saying, to, to look across these millions of bases and, and understand what's happening in each of us. Um, Kendall, could you explain genetic sequencing then and what we're seeing on the screen now and how this process of reading one's DNA, RNA, and proteins works? 
Yep, so um, starting with the sample. So we can get samples from lots of different things. Um, and people who have participated in different uh, Fox Foundation events might have given different types of biofluids. We call them either you know, samples of blood or urine or saliva. Um, and when we get these samples, we have to separate out the different components because they're a big mixture of things that we were just talking about. There's whole cells with DNA in them and RNA and proteins, but we can't look at all of them at the same time, so we separate them into different ingredients. Um, and then when we do that, um, we can then do different things with them. They each sort of require different downstream um, research techniques. DNA and, R and RNA are similar in that they're basically made of the same molecules um, that we can look at on something called a, a sequencer. And the sequencer will read out each one of the letters of either the DNA or the RNA. Um, that's what the read or sequencing, the, the different sections of that is. And then bioinformatically, so on the back end using computers and other types of analysis, we can put all of those read sequences back together to, to read out the long stretches of DNA or RNA. And then we can tell differences between individuals, between individuals with disease or, or people who do not. Um, we can start to tease apart, you know, environmental exposures and other things that will help us understand disease better. Okay. Uh, looking at number one on this graphic, it says from a biological sample, Parkinson's is a brain disease. What samples do you look at and how does that help us understand what's happening in the brain? Kendall, could you answer that one? Yeah, um, so again, uh, we try to look at lots of different sample types. So for instance, um, cerebral spinal fluid is a, is a good one, but as a first line of looking at expression changes in individuals or participating in clinical trials, it's a harder barrier to meet because not everyone wants to go through a lumbar puncture. So we're looking for alternative biofluids that will also give us information about the brain. Um, all the cellular characteristics, the things that are happening inside the cells in the brain, often happen in cells in other tissues and in the periphery. So we can look at some aspects of the disease um, expression levels associated with certain genetic changes and, and other things. So we do get a, a little window into the brain by using these more peripheral um, resources that are a little bit less invasive to get to. Like you said, more accessible, more people able to give the samples and, and more data. And Samantha, speaking of more data, we look at different populations as well, right? It's not just people who already have Parkinson's disease. It's people at risk of Parkinson's or control populations to compare. Can you talk to us more about the need to look across different cohorts or groups? Sure, Maggie. So that's a really important point. Um, as Kendall had noted earlier, Parkinson's disease is a disease of aging. So we really want to make sure that we're understanding the Parkinson's component versus the aging component. So for that reason, it's really important that as we're looking um, in samples from people with Parkinson's disease, side by side, we're also looking in healthy volunteer subjects or people um, who don't have Parkinson's disease so that we can really separate out the effects of just regular aging and exposure to the environment uh, long term on um, this whole process or um, the process to make these proteins versus um, what might be happening that's disease specific or Parkinson's specific. And David, we look over time too, correct? As Kendall was saying, this expression is often in flux. So how do you know if something is really linked to disease or if it's just a momentary change due to different factors? Well, that's really one of the, um, you know, in many ways it's kind of obvious. You you have somebody and you take measurements of them over time. Um, now, that's really actually a challenge to do in studies, to have somebody come in to get a blood draw or another tissue source at specific intervals. And then you have to compare them to a control group, um, and you have to know a lot of different things. And so these steps are often kind of the the hurdles that um, must be overcome to really do these types of longitudinal studies. But when you do it right, you really get unique insights because it says changes that occur over a person 
um, that really allows us to use that person's baseline or where they started for as a control. So it's not just you know, a group of individuals with Parkinson's versus a group of people without. It's also you versus your previous self. And over six months ago, a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, and that additional kind of way of looking at things can provide us with greater, greater clarity of what is actually just a difference between two people or just a difference between natural aging. So in many ways, if you design it with multiple sets of controls, both yourself and other individuals, you have greater ability to resolve those um, truly meaningful changes. Bradford, is this work only in research so far? If I was a person with Parkinson's or someone who I thought perhaps may be at risk of Parkinson's due to a family history, for example, could I have my genes genetically sequenced using this technology, or is this only more in the research phase? That's a great question, Maggie. So um, I'd, I'd kind of start by separating it out into two separate questions, kind of how does genetic testing work and, and what is available right now? And there's basically two major strategies that are available. One is genotyping, which is uh, kind of the commercial panel that you see a lot in, in hospitals and you see it advertised a lot for heredity and for disease prediction, things like that. There's also genetic sequencing, which is what we've talked about today, and um, they're, they're Usage is slightly different. Uh, the genotype type studies, uh, those give you whether or not you are positive, whether you carry specific genetic mutations. Uh, sequencing is also available, but it tends to be uh, something that's used a little less often. It's, uh, it's costly, it's time consuming, and, and the analysis, is, as Kendall mentioned, requires a, a lot of sophisticated work on the computer. So uh, it's something that we don't generally use uh, as a diagnostic approach, um, at least not for common neurological disorders, but it is something that's available. So it's, it's usually not something you, you would find that your physician would offer to you, but it, it's something that we primarily use for research. And Maggie, this is Samantha, I just wanted to... Oh, I'm sorry, Meg. I just wanted to interject um, and say that there is um, an ongoing effort through MJFF called Fox Insight, which is a way to um, uh, participate in, in research just from the, the comfort of your own uh, couch or living room. It's um, a way to um, provide information about um, your life or your Parkinson's disease if you have it um, just by filling out online surveys. And as part of that study, there is a collaboration between um, Fox Insight and MJFF and 23andMe, um, where uh, eligible participants may be able to get a, a kit from 23andMe uh, through that program. So if anybody's interested in that, um, the, the website um, where they could find more information would be uh, foxinsight.michaeljfox.org. Samantha, that was going to be the next question I asked, so thanks for jumping in and, and giving that information. And we will make sure that we send that website through in the follow-up email that we send after your attendance at this webinar. So again, that's foxinsight.org, and um, yeah, appreciate you highlighting that resource, Samantha. So our, let's jump ahead and talk a little bit, uh, the real meat of this conversation of why this genetic sequencing is so important. What do we hope to learn from it? How is it going to help us get to treatments? So David, maybe you could give us just a high level of the goals of genetic sequencing. What are we looking for when we find a difference in Parkinson's? How are we going to use that? The, the end goal is we're, we're really trying to find um, changes in our genetic code whether they or or changes in our what's expressed that help us identify um, better um, therapeutic targets, better therapies, but also can be used perhaps as a measure um, of disease progression. Maybe they give us an earlier insight. There's quite a bit that we can learn. We can learn how a disease's biology works. Um, and so what we want to do is to be able to take and integrate in a lot of different types of sequencing. We kind of hinted upon it, but there are different types. One of the major studies that has been occurring over the past decade is this idea of sequencing the inherited genome. And there's been a lot of efforts there, and we have a lot of new insights, both with genotyping, of where these key regions are that harbor susceptibility alleles, you know, these genes that you say might be associated with, with development of Parkinson's. 
But now, and through some of the more recent studies, we're looking actually at what is expressed and what's turned on. And this is really an emerging area where we look at the RNA. And at this point, it's basically then looking at the RNA at different time points to see, okay, if this change at the DNA level is there, does it impact one gene? Maybe it impacts a suite of genes. And that's one of the more interesting things is how one thing, one letter that you're inherited can actually lead to a cascade of events. And we can use those through, you know, some really nice math and computational methods to try to get insights into them. So they all tie together. And the most important part about that is that, there, that there's clinical information tied to it, you know, insights into one person's course. That helps us kind of put together these puzzle pieces in a way that isn't just what you're born with, but also what happened over the lifetime. And Kendall, how could we take those differences in identifying what you're born with and what changes, as David said, to better measure or treat Parkinson's disease? So most cases of Parkinson's disease probably result from complex interactions of the environment and genetic factors. These are called um, sporadic cases where there's no history of the disorder in your family. But the causes of these sporadic cases have lots of commonalities with things that we find out about people who have the genetics that make them at high risk for Parkinson's disease. So figuring out the common pathways and figuring out how these biologically function um, helps us figure out how Parkinson's disease occurs. So for example, um, in the synuclein gene, everybody with Parkinson's disease gets aggregated clumps of alpha synuclein. Finding out that synuclein uh, mutations in the synuclein gene can cause misfolding of the protein or increases in the expression of the folding that lead to the disease helps all Parkinson's patients in the fact that we've identified then pathways that we can use to target therapies towards. The same thing with LARP2 variants. Um, this is an enzyme that has an overactivation, and so if we can identify inhibitors, they might help not only the individuals with the genetics, but also people um, with sporadic Parkinson's disease. So um, really, it's about identifying the pathways. And another way to do that is for us to put this RNA sequencing, which changes expression uh, to reflect other things going on in your life, um, may also lead us to new pathways for targeting therapies as well. But these RNA expressions, um, we can also use after um, someone joins a clinical trial or something like that to identify whether or not you know, we're moving the right pathways in the right direction. So um, monitoring information through sequencing and other stuff, monitoring these genes and proteins and their expression levels has multiple levels of influence that we can use for making things um, better. Okay, so it sounds like we're looking for differences between people who don't have Parkinson's and people who do as a first place to look. And then we're looking across people who do have Parkinson's for similarities, like you said, to illuminate those pathways that we can then target with therapies and stop the dysfunction that's associated with the disease. So, um, Samantha, we see on the screen, and Kendall just referenced some, some the big three, as we call them, of, of Parkinson's genetic targets right now, SNCA, which is alpha-synuclein, LERC2, and GBA. Can you give us a very brief update on where we are therapeutically against these targets and kind of how sequencing has led us to this point? Sure. So I think Kendall really nicely just highlighted um, how insights in genetics um, can lead us to discover commonalities or common pathways that can be uh, implicated in Parkinson's disease. And uh, as you said, these are sort of the, the big three targets right now. Uh, we know that alpha-synuclein accumulates in the brains of everybody with Parkinson's disease, regardless of whether or not they have a particular mutation. Um, and some of the, the drugs that are currently being tested in the clinic directly target um, this alpha-synuclein um, in order to sort of um, remove the, the, the toxic form or to just decrease 
um, the amount of, of pathogenic uh, alpha-synuclein that's available. Um, certainly there were also insights coming from, from some of these other targets, like um, LERP2, as, as Kendall mentioned. Um, this is a, a protein that can have increased activity in people with the mutation, um, and there are currently um, drugs that are being tested that actually work to decrease that activity that are being tested in um, people, people with LERP2 mutations that may actually also be useful in people with uh, just regular common sporadic or idiopathic Parkinson's disease or uh, unknown uh, caused Parkinson's disease that don't have the genetic mutation based on the fact that some of the pathways um, that are um, activated by, by this protein going wrong uh, are the same in, in this genetic form and in the sporadic form. And, and likewise for GBA, we know um, from some of the biology work that um, when, when people have this, this GBA mutation, it is possible um, that the enzymes in, in all of their cells or the, the powerhouses in all of their cells are not um, functioning properly. Um, but that alone doesn't necessarily cause Parkinson's disease, but there are um, targeted therapeutics that are specifically working on this particular pathway uh, also that may be useful for um, people with, with general Parkinson's disease as well because all of these um, three proteins here not only have genetic targets but also converge on a common biological pathway. Okay. We got a question from the audience and I often hear that, you know, I've tested negative for the LERC2 mutation or the GBA mutation. So how do I have Parkinson's or I won't get Parkinson's if, if the person does not yet. Are these it for Parkinson's genes or it seems from all the work that we're doing that there's probably a lot more to discover? Bradford, what do you think? Uh, that's a really good question. So we definitely, I'll start by just saying we definitely don't think that this is it. While these are known to be key genes in, in understanding Parkinson's disease, at least from a hereditary perspective, we also have a lot of evidence that implicates other genes in, in PD. So uh, one of the things that we want to do as scientists is build out our understanding of those other genes uh, to understand the pathways that they interact in and make sure that we can have a more holistic view of, of how all the different genes add up. You know, we often say that uh, a relatively small portion of, of Parkinson's cases are, are strictly genetic. And I know that earlier it was mentioned that really this is a complex disorder, right? So this is something where it may be an interaction between your genes and the environment. It may be uh, genes that we don't look at routinely. Uh, it may be a lot of different factors that, that determine whether or not an individual will go on to have Parkinson's. So we have to really uh, take in all of these different data sets and and really leverage them against each other to, to get down to the, the bottom of it. So in addition to these three, we definitely have additional uh, gene pathways that we think are, are significant right now. Some of those include things that are relevant for inflammation, for example. Uh, some of those include you know, genes that really don't seem to have any functional role in, in, uh, in the brain or in, in uh, nervous system. So it's, it's really an interesting challenge to try to make the most of those. And David, do you think that some of what we know already and some of what we may discover will explain the difference in the type of Parkinson's that someone has? You know, I'm going to repeat the phrase that everyone in Parkinson's research and care has heard. If you've met one person with Parkinson's, you've met one person with Parkinson's. Everyone has their own symptoms and progression rate. Do you think that some of that might be in the genes? You know, I, I do, and I think it's not just in the genes you're born with. And I think we heard something really important. We heard that not very many people who have Parkinson's had this SNCA, this alpha synuclein mutation. But then we heard something else. At the protein level, this is seen across the board in all Parkinson's. So at one level, we only a few people have a variant that may be in the alpha synuclein gene, but somehow, some way, there is accumulation of alpha synuclein protein um, within the brain. So there must be multiple ways by which we get to these. And what that says is that, you know, these genes all fit together. And, you know, it may be that you, you do have a variant that, that is one of the ones that's listed up there, but maybe not. But they all kind of fit together. 
Now, there are differences in the types of changes, and some have a bigger impact. You can imagine some are downstream and some are not. And I think each individual piece kind of really helps us get a bigger picture of what, what is Parkinson's. So, so, so it is true that, you know, every, I'm going to use a puzzle piece. Every puzzle piece is different. But when you start to put them together, you do see commonalities. And what you can say up front is, you know, at the DNA level, while the majority of people do not have LARC2, alpha synuclein or GBA mutations, there seems to be involvement of all these genes in most individuals, and in some case all individuals, um, with, with Parkinson's, but it's further downstream. And so the integration of the RNA, the DNA, and protein are kind of the tools that we're using here, tied in with the individual differences that someone experiences, and for this, having the clinical histories, the histories of the people, and putting that into play as well. So it's going to be a complex answer to a complex question. Uh, Kendall, I want to talk to you about biomarkers and using some of these just as we are targeting alpha-synuclein to stop Parkinson's from what we learned from genetically sequencing. We are also looking to measure alpha-synuclein to diagnose and better track disease and to test the impact of therapies. You're doing some of this work into biomarkers and measuring RNA. Can you talk to us about the value of that work in helping us better understand, diagnose, and treat PD? Yeah, so biomarkers are important, and people, you know, encounter biomarkers all the time, whether they know it or not. Whenever you go to the doctor and you get your blood pressure taken, for example, that's a kind of biomarker. So if your blood pressure is high or it's low, then it leads to more tests to try to figure out why that's occurring. And so one of the hopes with um, identifying biomarkers for Parkinson's disease would be that these um, could be applied very early when um, people may be just at risk um, and not have the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. That means that they could be put into clinical trials earlier and therapies could be tried earlier, different things like that. So on the front end, having biomarkers and the ability to tell when someone's at high risk would be great because then you could do some um, additional things to try to prevent or slow um, the impact of the disease. Once you have the disease, you know, early on in Parkinson's, um, Parkinson's disease is actually sort of difficult to separate from some other closely related Parkinsonism um, uh, diseases such as multiple system atrophy and some others. And so identifying, again, which disease you actually have early will help impact the way that you could be treated and, and different things and therapies that can be applied to you. So I think that all of these different things, again, the differences in individuals and other things will become more and more important. As David said earlier, too, following an individual, you yourself, and how you're changing over time or how you change in response to therapies is going to become important, too. And monitoring that information through biomarkers is how we're going to get to that type of information. Great. That brings us to our next slide, to a big project that uh, has a primary goal of finding biomarkers and is a source for a lot of the sequencing work and data collection that we've been talking about, which is our Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative or PPMI study. Samantha, you have done a lot around PPMI. Can you tell us about the study and why collecting this clinical data is helping us better understand what's happening in our genes? Sure, Maggie. So our, our PPMI study is collecting data from nearly 1,400 participants around the world. Uh, these are people with Parkinson's disease, uh, individuals who have risk factors such as genetic mutations, uh, who might be predisposed to develop Parkinson's disease, and control volunteers without a link to the disease. Um, these people all come in over a period of five to ten years for clinical assessments, motor assessments, brain imaging scans, and fluid collections like donations of blood and spinal fluid, for example. Because there's so much data available um, in PPMI and so many different aspects, like I just said, the, the clinical and the biofluids and the imaging, um, this really enables scientists to look at the data either alone or in combination. And if you add in the power from all of the genetic data that we've been talking about, um, you can really look 
side by side with the genetic data, the clinical data, the imaging data sets to start answering questions about whether there are particular subtypes of Parkinson's disease, which could help us understand, for example, why some people might respond better to a particular drug treatment, or it could help us to better diagnose uh, people with Parkinson's disease or really understand disease progression over time. Understood. As Kendall, Kendall and David, you guys were talking about kind of making those connections between um, the type of PD that someone has. You need all that data on the type of PD that they have to make those connections. So jumping ahead again to the project that um, Kendall and David, you have recently undertaken to uh, sequence the RNA of the people in the Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative. David, can you tell us about this project and its scope? It is enormous, to say the least. <laughs> This study is actually tremendously enormous, and it was a study that, you know, I really pursued being involved with because we work with a lot of different diseases myself and neurological diseases and work at cancer. There really isn't a parallel that is at this point to this. We have, you know, 1,500 individuals, more than that, you know, collected over a period of time where we have the RNA, we have the whole genome sequence, and we have this rich clinical history. And so the technology has now emerged to look at not just DNA, but look at RNA. And so um, really brought in by my colleague Kendall, the idea then to look at um, this full measurement. And it's, it's massive, and it's good to think of numbers. We're generating um, 200 trillion pieces of data on each individual. It's 200 billion. That is a tremendous amount of information to get insights into 50,000 genes and so forth. And so really what it is is one of the most exhaustive investigations of the genetics of available tissue, in this case whole blood, along with all of the inherited DNA and all of the clinical information and provides us one of the um, best tools I could think of to get insights into finding new biomarkers in accessible tissues such as blood and discovering new biology. There are studies which are coming along which are like this, but they're not nearly as far as along. So this is really a pioneering study that's setting a kind of a, a standard from, from at least my point of view. Um, it's it's a, um, a big endeavor for sure. Can you explain the graph that we're looking at on the screen and what you could take away from that? Yeah, um, this is um, one of the things that we want to do is, you know, there's a part where if you were um, studying a gene and you were you were trying to find, maybe you had some new insights, you were seeing a, a, new, a new inherited variation, you might want to look at that gene and say, hey, is that expressed in the blood? Is it different, right? So one of the ways which we've been working on is developing tools that allow both simple questions like, is this gene expressed or is this turned on? Or, and also then allows you to get introduced to the data and maybe go a little bit deeper and there are tools for that and it gets, it's down a deep rabbit hole. But at a high level, you know, this is an example where in this plot we're looking at a gene and we picked a gene that is um, one that's involved in um, something called X inactivation. Females have two X chromosomes and so randomly one gets turned off and the way this occurs is by the turning on of this gene. And so this gene is an example of something that differs in one part of our cohort in what you're seeing in the Orange is the expression level for females and males. And, you know, what's interesting about this is if you looked at this gene, you looked at different cohorts, you might get a kind of a, might think that, well, one of the cohorts might have more males and females or something like that. You might not be able to really figure out, well, is that a cause or an effect? And so the clinical data and being able to partition out this. So in this chart, we are just seeing some of the different enrollment cohorts, they're part of this PPMI study, PD would be Parkinson's, and there are several others, including those with genetic predispositions. So I show this gene to show a trait that so very clearly separates and one that we can all kind of relate. 
but that is actually kind of just the tease and the fact the real thing that we're looking for are similar types of genes that separate maybe PD progression, uh, maybe different aspects of PD. There may be several genes fitting together, and um, that is actually the case with this gene. This example of a gene which shuts down several other genes. And so when you put all these together, you can get that puzzle. So this picture is kind of just a way to kind of um, open up the Pandora's box, per se, um, and um, get one view. And so it's one of the tools that we're kind of working on to make accessible. And it's something that has implications both within PD and the larger cohorts that are being studied. I mean, the, not the larger cohorts, the different cohorts that come downstream that follow this study in different disorders. You know, a lot of people will follow this study and try to see how it can impact other diseases and disorders and how we discover biomarkers. So we want to provide tools to enable that. And PPMI is at this time only collecting data from people with Parkinson's or Parkinson's risk factors and control volunteers. But Kendall, you mentioned earlier how some of this work could perhaps allow us to differentiate Parkinson's from other, Parkinson's from other, as we call them, Parkinsonisms, multiple system atrophy or uh, progressive supranuclear palsy and those other conditions that look like Parkinson's but then we know have some differences clinically and biologically. Could what we're learning from this project, the RNA sequencing project, or genetic sequencing in general help us better understand and treat those other conditions as well? Yes. So, um, again, it goes back to this combination of looking at these RNA expressions over time and across different cohorts of individuals. So people who have MSA versus people who have clear Parkinson's disease, what are the differences in the expression of their RNA? And then that can become biomarkers, or it can also point you to the pathways that are different between these two, and then develop therapies that could target them better, right? So individuals with MSA uh, potentially would have different targets that would have, uh, better, have better outcomes for their disease than Parkinson's. I also know of some other groups, um, such as the ALS Association, which has done also um, their own whole blood sequencing, like we've done for Parkinson's, um, and they can make use of our controls. They can look at differences um, between their group of, of individuals and ours in order to make differences about their disease, point to new pathways and different pathways um, that are important for each disease. But each one of these data sets gives us a whole lot more information that we can put together and understand, understand the complexity of multiple diseases at the same time. And so um, these big data sets with all of this clinical information associated with them just can have an infinite number of insights that we can, we can sort of drill down on. So once you think of the idea, we can go and look at it in the data. I think that's really powerful. That is. And um, as you were saying earlier about the synuclein commonality across the Parkinson's population. Could you be looking for similarities across disease lines rather than differences so that therapies already in development for one may work for another? Yeah, I think that's important too. Um, there are common pathways that we've hit on um, already, pathways that uh, prevent the degradation of proteins, which get you to the same place where you have these clumpy um, alpha-synuclein deposits um, or an increase in alpha-synuclein. So those two pathways get you to the same point, but they might not be identical. And these are things we could work out with um, looking at expression. Can we see differences between these two pathways that lead to the same thing? And then will we target these a little bit differently with drugs? And that would be really important um, for individuals to figure out which pathway would be the best to target for them. So individualizing some of the therapies, too, depending on what type of expression you have in some of these molecules is really important. And all of those things, those complex things that we haven't been able to study before are becoming a little bit more clear and accessible. Right. So it seems like you kind of have to look apart for differences and then look together for similarities and then look apart for differences again. You're always kind of uh, teasing to find more and then trying to apply those findings as wide as you can to help as many people as you can. Um, I want to get to our last content slide and then switch to questions because our audience does have so many questions. 
But Kendall, you had just mentioned about the need for these large data sets and comparison across data sets. And Bradford, I wanted to turn it over to you to highlight a large program that the Michael J. Fox Foundation is a part of that is doing more of this sequencing work outside of just PPMI and comparing that across studies. So um, Bradford, could you introduce us to this AMP-PD partnership? Sure. So the AMP-PD partnership is really interesting. It stands for the Accelerating Medicines Partnership Program. Um, and while there are a number of others targeted towards other diseases, um, we obviously uh, wanted to do what we could for Parkinson's as well. And it really arose out of an understanding that there's a need for uh, a, a a lot of collaboration to really get these big projects done and to really leverage the strengths of industry uh, as well as the NIH and, and their, their organization, uh, as well as people like the Fox Foundation that have a lot of disease-specific insight and try to bring people together to really accomplish these really big tasks. And so essentially what it is is a, it's a shared uh, work plan where we all work together. Uh, we have representatives from these different industry components, these different pharmaceutical companies, for example, uh, as well as leadership from the NIH and, and then from the Fox Foundation. And, you know, uh, on face value, it's, it's basically funding, but it really comes with a lot of oversight as well. And so, for example, we're building out a lot of resources to where we can accomplish these really large data collection efforts and then also collaborative analysis. Uh, and that's actually something that David and Kendall uh, are also working with us on on the researcher end. Um, and Samantha is also working uh, on us on the organizational end to try to bring all these different parties together and make the most of all these different collections. Uh, so there's a lot of different components to it. Um, for example, all of these uh, all of these genomic and transcriptomic data sets will, will be uploaded to a, a shared platform that's going to allow for collaborative analysis um, and really a lot of, I, I think, very powerful discovery tools that really can't be accomplished uh, by any one uh, partner. So it's something that really leverages the strengths of all the different partners. And Maggie, also, I, the cool thing about uh, the AMPD effort and, and PPMI is that um, by doing all of the same exact RNA sequencing uh, processes on multiple different cohorts, this really um, enables us to have one really, really big, uh, large data set that gives scientists really great confidence when they're drawing conclusions because there's uh, more samples included. And one of, I think, my favorite aspects of PPMI and the AMPD program is that all of the data is made publicly available to the research community. So this really enables us to have as many eyes as possible and as many smart people as possible looking at our data and bringing their own specific expertise to really answer PD-specific questions. So it's a really great opportunity to, to leverage people from other fields and our own field to really uh, hone in on, on PD biomarkers. Great. And Smith, I know you've done so much work on that project, so um, I'm glad to see that it's it's moving forward with such momentum. Speaking of moving forward, we are going to continue to the question portion of the hour. So uh, you, again, you see that Q&A box on your screen. Please enter your questions there, and our panelists and our uh, specialists behind the scenes will try to answer as much as we can. So um, I'm going to send it over to David, to you first. And we talked a little bit about this earlier in the hour, but I think it's of great interest to the community epigenetics and what you can do to impact your genes and their expression. And the audience was asking for more of a definition of epigenetics and then also if there was anything concrete that they could do, whether it's diet, exercise, anything else to positively impact their genetic expression. So that, that's a very that's a great question and it gets at the heart of one of the, this, this RNA-based study that we're doing. Um, so they, there's a lot of definitions for epigenetics, but uh, one of them is looking at what isn't just per se inherited. And so the, the example I, I give is um, if you looked at calico cats and you saw two that were identical, you know, clones of one another, they would look entirely different because one gene that's involved in coloring gets methylated and basically there are changes that are made that turn it on and off. That gene actually is the XIS gene I mentioned earlier. But it's an example of a process that occurs where a genome is basically changed into what can be turned on and off. Kendall mentioned some processes earlier where um, basically by the kind of bundling up of the DNA, it can change. Um, 
I, I know of, and I think actually um, Kendall could probably give some examples, but the, towards the question of positively, um, positively impacting one's expression. I think as scientists, we all actually see ways which we are, we believe this can be done. And I think many of us are part of studies evaluating this. Um, I think there is, I, I'm aware of studies which have shown a very positive impact of diet and exercise. And so I can say that diet and exercise are things that, you know, there is people looking at. It does seem to impact expression. There's a lot more research that goes on, but it's a good thing. Um, and um, I think that we really are at the cusp of trying to understand and attack this. That's what's so actually exciting about this data set. The longitudinal aspect, to be able to have someone with so much information and that they volunteered for this study, to have gone in and be collected, to go through the screening visits, this is how we start to get real insights into epigenetics. We need, we need to be able to measure specimens. We need the clinical information. And so I think this study will actually be able to help us gain real insight that is actually meaningful, reproducible, and what, as scientists, we all hope to achieve while really giving insights into the underpinnings of PD. Great, and I, I know the follow-up questions are going to be what diet and what exercise, so I just want to share that we have a number of I'd like of to know that too. Yeah, exactly. When we all want that one magic answer, but um, uh, you know, unfortunately it's, it's more vegetables and fewer donuts, but we do have some uh, information on our website uh, about that and um, and yeah, as you said, research is hard, but you can be an N of one and do your own study on what works best for you. Bradford, questions on the letters in DNA that we talk about, that A, C, T, G, what are they and what do they mean? Sure, so those are actually sugars, essentially. They're, they're molecules that make up the individual code. So we've all seen the, the, the image of the double helix, right, that we've known about for a long time. Um, and each step of that ladder essentially represents uh, a single character. And, and like you said, there's just four letters, C, A, T, and G. Uh, and from that, uh, patterns of characters actually are, are what is translated into protein by, by the process of going through RNA again. So each of those, uh, it doesn't really have any specific power on its own, uh, other than being able to, to pair with its partner on the other strand. But uh, it's, it's really the combination together. And that's why we can get such incredible diversity out of such a small number of letters. And really, it's a, it's a pretty amazing system. And Kendall, speaking of the, the letters in DNA, we talk about getting to therapies by learning from DNA, RNA, and proteins. But are therapies only addressing the proteins, or are there treatments that are trying to alter RNA gene expression or even someone's DNA? Someone in the audience asked about CRISPR specifically. Could you tell us more about that? Um, I think modifications of DNA are still um, far off in the future. It's more um, the current therapies are targeting more RNA expression and protein expression. I'd say for the most part, those end molecules, proteins, are easier to target in terms of you can make them function a little better or a little less. So we talked about LARC2 having too much enzymatic activity. It does a little too much work. So finding inhibitors that reduce that enzyme activity are a little bit easier right now for therapeutic um, than doing something like a DNA change, which is going to come with a whole lot more testing and, and is definitely something more um, going to be available probably, but much further in the future. Um, but right now, I think that of the, the DNA, RNA, protein, um, the three of them, proteins are, are much easier to target and something that um, there are people working on currently in a whole host of pathways that are relevant for Parkinson's disease. Let me stick with you and follow up on that because we've gotten a lot of questions about mitochondria as well and that pathway, its connection to Parkinson's and to our genes. What's happening with mitochondrial understanding related to Parkinson's, Kendall? 
So Parkinson's disease is a, it does affect mitochondria. Some of the recessive genes associated with Parkinson's disease that were found early, like Parkin, Pink1, DJ1, they all affect mitochondrial output um, and oxidative stress. So oxidative stress and inflammation are both uh, predominant features of Parkinson's disease too. And all of these things, again, are being worked on in terms of what pathways they affect and ways that we can modify this risk, fix oxidative stress inside of cells, and, and try to promote more healthy mitochondria function. Um, all of these things are, are known in parts of what people are trying to drive towards with therapies and along with are looking at can we tell differences in mitochondrial function either by genetics or RNA expression? And then what areas can we use um, to, again, affect those outcomes to make more healthy mitochondria? It, it's definitely a known aspect of Parkinson's disease that's being actively worked on. All right. Samantha, you're not escaping uh, my question section. <laughs> We got a question on translating biomarkers to actually usable tools for trials. It seems that often in the headlines there's a brand new test for Parkinson's and then you learn that it's really very preliminary and hasn't been validated. Can you talk to us about the process of finding this difference and measuring it and then all the challenges in the process of actually getting it to be a test for Parkinson's disease? Sure. So it, it's true. Sometimes uh, we all get excited when we see a, a report, but uh, I think the most important thing to keep in mind is that um, if something is really robust and reliable, it will um, still be reported across different cohorts, across different handlers. So the analogy I like to think of is um, when, when Budweiser makes beer at any one of its many <laughs> factories around the world, uh, it all tastes the same no matter where in the world you're consuming the beer. Um, so the same thing is true for, for assays. We really want to make sure that um, whenever we test uh, people with Parkinson's disease, and they definitely have Parkinson's disease, they definitely have these markers. And likewise, um, if somebody's running that particular type of test in Australia, um, on the same sample, they're getting the same result as somebody who's running that test um, here in New York. So that's what we call validation, um, and we really, before we ensure that something is a, a validated biomarker for, for Parkinson's disease, we really want to make sure that it has certain characteristics, and the most important things are reliability and reproducibility of a result. Um, so we have, in our biomarkers program here at uh, NJFF, we fund um, development of biomarker assays across all the spectrums, um, so we really want to encourage the development of new assays, but we also um, really want to make sure that when an assay looks promising or it's been shown that something is changing in people with Parkinson's disease or uh, over time with progression, that we really take the time to make sure that, that it's uh, really true by making sure that the uh, key assay characteristics or um, reliability and reproducibility are, are on point. An assay, for those of us who don't work in a lab, is a test and the methods that you use to perform that test. Um, all right. Well, we are coming up on our uh, on our hour, but I wanted to um, ask uh, David you first, and then Kendall give you the final word on why you think this work is so important. What you want to leave our audience with around sequencing and its potential to help us better understand, measure, and treat Parkinson's disease. So, David, any final thoughts? Um, you know, I think that really what we have with sequencing and all of these technologies we talk about is an incredible discovery platform by which all sorts of things can be understood, and it impacts researchers in lots of ways. We could discover something by looking at it for the first time, just looking across the board for something new, but then there's also tremendous value where other researchers may say, I want to ask a question because this data set measured every part of the blood they could. And so really, you know, the, the exciting part um, I think of is the wonderful platform that is this, these longitudinal, these time series collections, these people going into these visits, providing this information to researchers, impacts really Parkinson's, impacts research in Parkinson's therapies, impacts other disorders, and it's a wonderful kind of way that Parkinson's is leading really in developing these in terms of the community and the, the, the patients. This is an area where it's really setting the stage. 
And Kendall, anything to add as the last words from our panel today? Yeah, I, I think what David said is really great. I would just add that this is a really great platform. This um, Michael J. Fox Foundation effort combined with the AMPD effort really creates a huge database where people can test hypotheses. So anybody doing science, thinking about something, whether it's related to Parkinson's disease or another disease, could basically go and look at this data set and test a hypothesis in kind of a rapid manner. Does this make sense? Do we see any changes in this pathway? Um, and so it, it'll actually have broad implications for a lot of areas. Thank you, and I want to remind everyone, if you have Parkinson's disease and you want to participate in genetic research, our online study, Fox Insight, is at www.foxinsight.org, and you can learn more about joining the study and contributing genetic data. Thank you for our panelists for joining me today, and thank you everyone who's logged on and joined us. Uh, we'll be sending a link to the webinar to listen on demand or share, and we hope that you will mark your calendars for next month's webinar on the third Thursday, June 20th, where we'll be replaying a popular webinar on how the immune system and inflammation may play a role in Parkinson's disease. And we'll have staff behind the scenes to answer your questions live. So I hope you'll join us, and thanks again for joining us for this show.